Running in the cloud is great, but for a system of any complexity, it's unlikely that all of your services or all of your infrastructure are all going to be in the same region, and hey, maybe not even in the same cloud provider. This means we have to understand how networking works in the cloud. I'm talking to Dan Lamott today. He's an SRE, works on Confluent Cloud, uh, to talk about just how this works and what kind of networking solutions Confluent Cloud supports. It's all on today's episode of Streaming Audio, a podcast about Kafka, Confluent, and the cloud. Hello and welcome to another episode of Streaming Audio. I am once again your host, Tim Berglund, and we're here, as I've been saying for the last few episodes, in audio version as always and in video on YouTube. If you prefer to consume your podcasts by looking at the faces of the people who are talking, you can do that now. So uh, in fact, if you're watching the video, it's probably weird for me to be saying that because you already know. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad to be joined in the studio today by my colleague, Dan Lamott. Dan and I are going to talk about a thing called Private Link. Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. You got it, man. Um, before we get into Private Link and, and cloud private networks and, and uh, network engineering and some fun stuff I want to talk about, how about you? What, uh, what is it that you do here? Well, I've been working at Confluent for a little over two and a half years now, doing a lot of just SRE work and Confluent infrastructure or Confluent cloud infrastructure work. Um, these days, I'm on the traffic team and I'm the team lead working on how customers connect to Confluent cloud. So nice. Yeah. Ah, so private link seems relevant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I I want to get into that, but um, what are the what are the primary ways? Um, because it, it's funny, I'm like, well, I mean, there's the, there's clients and there's the command line and there's funky network things, but how do customers connect? How do, how do people connect to Confluent Cloud? Yeah, we have a number of options. So we have like public internet connectivity. We have your peering style connectivity. Um, Transit Gateway is a kind of a flavor of peering. Um, and then we also support Private Link, which is our latest addition to that kind of portfolio of connectivity options. Gotcha. Um, uh, so public internet, if so, for the, the demos that I would do and stuff like that, if I'm going to show people, you know, here's the Confluent Cloud command line interface, or I have a Java client and I'm doing something. I mean, that's just that's just good old internet. Mm -hmm. um, what's peering? Tell us about peering, because I know that that term comes up in kind of internet backbone architecture discussions. So yeah, it? It, it's just like point to point um, in in the cloud. It's between two VPCs, sometimes in the same region, sometimes cross region, but it's it's like joining your two networks together. So. Um, there's a number of good and bad things that come of that, and um, but it, it is a private way to connect to Confluent Cloud instead of using the internet. So, um, it, gotcha. From a security posture, it's much better. Much better. Much better. And I'm going to make you define absolutely everything. VPC. This okay. is assuming if you don't know a lot about network engineering or cloud connectivity, I'm going to I'm just going to assume that listener that is you. So, what's a VPC? VPC is kind of your virtual private cloud. It's just a network space that is uh, where you launch your instances in the cloud that you can kind of connect to other um, VPCs, for instance. But is, Got it. Yeah. So it, if I could just bring it down to networking terms, there would be a set of IPs that are mine that are not routable from mm -hmm. the public internet. And if I have routes to the public internet, they're explicitly defined yes. kind of from, to, and ports and... Otherwise, there's there's no free for all. There's no there's no ping. There is no <laughs> yeah. old old memory from thirty years ago. The utility finger, you know, hey, yeah. here's a user on another system. Tell me about yourself. Yeah, uh, those trusting days. But so it's just not. It's not. It's a VPC is is really a, you know a virtualized private area that Correct. there's no in or out. That's not defined. Yep, it's all gotcha. private to your company. So private IPs only. And so peering, and so uh, let us imagine I've got a VPC that's got uh, some services, microservices running in it in some way. Maybe I have a self-managed Kubernetes cluster, or I just like to manage them on their own or whatever. Uh, they're all in there, and they need to talk to Confluent Cloud. So what does peering do? Uh, how does peering make that work? Yeah, it allows these two VPCs to connect to each other over their private IP address space. So instead of 
creating a public IP that anything could connect to, appearing would allow two VPCs to talk to each other's private address space directly. Got it. Um, so is that really routing? I mean, is it ultimately routing and, and encryption? I mean, it is routing. Um, depending on which cloud you're in, you, you get exposed to less or more of it. Like in Azure and GCP, generally when you peer, um, it just works. Like the routes are automatically created for you. Everything's yeah. great. In AWS, they make you create these routes. And um, yeah, it's a little bit more. <laughs> a little bit more like the good old days. Yeah, the good old days of <laughs> somebody logging into a router and creating some route for... Right, know, yeah. right. Um, and for, for this, and I know private link is kind of our topic du jour, but I want to, I want to get there and build some pieces slowly. Um, uh, there, there, again, this is a little bit of a good old days technology. I mean, it's still a, a totally viable thing, but, uh, a site to site VPN, um, where you're, you know, it's, it's traffic that's absolutely routed over the public internet, mm -hmm. but, um, there aren't routes in the IP sense and the traffic is encrypted in some way. Is it analogous to that? Is it built on that kind of technology? Like what what are the pieces underneath that make this for, work? For a cloud peering, um, the, the high level analogy is definitely correct. Like it enables the same type of connectivity, um, but underneath is cloud provider specific details. So gotcha. um, it might be a VPN, it might be just some other kind of tunneling protocol or, or however they've implemented their underlay networking. Um, for instance, if it's the same region, they might, you know, shortcut a lot of these things and there might not be any of those things, but for cross region, maybe they do have to implement some more of these, um, kind of building blocks, but the, the experience you get is the same is that like in a site to site VPN, everything can kind of talk to each other on both side ends, um, with appearing, everything can talk to each other on both Got ends. It. So it's bi-directional. That's the key. And when you're an SRE for a cloud service, like say you are, um, I assume you do have to get to know some of those details with the different cloud providers. If yeah. you're just using one and kind of staying within the box and the rules and everything like, like I might do if I were setting something up, I would have the luxury of, as it were, not worrying my pretty little head about that. But, but you sort of have to dig into things, I guess, if you're. Yeah. If you're some of those it. details leak up to the top and uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the thing about abstractions, right? They're, they're good. And then they leak. Yeah. yeah exactly. uh, okay. So I we're diving into, um, uh, explicitly a thing that is not what we're talking about today, but peering, public internet, and you, you said, was there, was private link the only third one? I might be missing something in that list. Transit gateways in there, Transit gateway. um, but it, it's, it's like peering. It's identical to peering other than, um, it's just easier. Like it, it's more of the hub and spoke topology for, okay. whereas peering is just point to point. It can be between two VPCs and that's it. Transit gateway, you get like this hub where you can everybody can connect to, and then everybody that's connected to the hub is connected to each other. So, oh, okay. So by if if you if you're connected to the hub, you have connectivity to all the other pieces. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. And is transit gateway a uh, cloud specific? Because I know some of these things are. Well, I mean, they're they're general concepts, but the the word is a brand name for one of the providers. Is that just an AWS thing? It, it is an AWS thing. There is kind of like analogous features in Azure and GCP that are built on top of like peering. So it is, it's a bit confusing over there, but um, it is, it, it's kind of there. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's totally happening with, the, I, I see stuff in this part of the stack uh, and it's usually AWS, their, their thing kind of wins and everybody calls it that. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, you know, Xerox, Coke, yeah, um, Kleenex. All of a sudden, uh, that that brand name sort of dominates. Which, hey, good move. Yeah. Um, I guess we'd like to be that with fully managed Kafka. Uh, okay. So you got Transit Gateway, and then Private Link. So talk to us about that. So Private Link kind of changed the game for this. Um, also an AWS thing, right? Also an AWS thing, but also an Azure thing. And GCP has their thing that they just launched. It's not called Private Link, but it's the same kind of thing. So it, all three clouds um, is a very popular connectivity that's showed up, um, particularly because peering becomes problematic because we're actually sharing address space with the company. So there's some amount of address space that the company has to give Confluent in order to peer because those addresses are now part of their network. 
And so they can't use it again in their network. And depending, um, that might be okay. Or if they're strapped for IPs, it might not be okay. Um, and so private link gets us out of that because all it needs is an IP per zone in the customer's VPC. Hmm. So maybe like three zones, three IPs. That's a very nice surface area to like, uh, you know, take away just to onboard a, a service like Confluent Cloud. How many IPs are you generally getting in a VPC? Uh, I mean, most people provision it with like a slash 16 or um, oh. like GCP allows much larger. Um, but These it, are it private really, after all, so, you know. Yeah, it, I mean. It, it's it's it, Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> everybody gets an IP, right? No, You get an IP. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it just depends. Like some companies prefer, you know, they might give you a slash 24. Right. If they're going to actually connect it to their network, you might not get a slash 16 for the VPC. Sure. The cloud provider supports it, no problem, but um, it's, it's very much company dependent. Gotcha. So, so um, anyway, being parsimonious with IPs, private link, uh, you said one IP per zone. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, again, just walk us through yeah. how it works and the problems it's solving and, and how it's a game changer. Yep. So, so once we get those three IPs, um, the customer can connect to those IPs to get to Confluent Cloud. Um, that connection is unidirectional now. It's no longer uh, bidirectional like it is with peering. So from a security posture, um, Confluent can't connect to the customer, but the customer can connect to Confluent. So it's, it's much better there. Um, and at that point, it's just easier to deal with. There's no routing to create. It's just IPs in your VPC, and away we go. So... Um, it does pose a number of engineering challenges for us to provide the service behind that because now Kafka, being that you need to direct traffic to specific brokers as a client, we have to figure out a way for the Kafka client to target a specific broker behind three IPs. We can't have an IP per broker anymore. Um, and so now we have a problem and that's the problem that um, we've been solving at Confluent Cloud. Like, um, there's kind of two main ways to solve it. Um, there's port mapping, where you might have like a port per broker, and the client would just direct traffic at that port. Or you could do um, what we've decided to do is a proxy layer with a SNI routing. So as clients connect to brokers, they encode a different TLS name for that broker in the connection, and we route based on that. And so this allows us to scale much farther than any of like the limits on the cloud providers have for their private link solutions. Some of those can be kind of problematic, which would not allow larger clusters because you run out of ports or um, other kinds of interesting issues that show up. Um, you know. But those clients are standard clients. So Correct. help me out with that. So they are still doing all of their regular connection pooling yep. and metadata gathering. And they, they have this idea that there's 60 by 60 brokers out there and they're, they'll have their own IP. So, um, yeah, where do we, where do we get to be there? I mean, where, where, uh, so you described the block diagram of the network chunks and like, I have that in my head, Mm -hmm. but I don't know where we have the opportunity to put software. (laughs) Oh, I guess, um, it works right now with the standard client and then right behind the private link, so, so, okay, maybe I'll explain um, what it looks like on the service provider side. Got it. So private link, there's like the endpoints that are put in the VPC, in the customer VPC. On the service provider side, we'll have a, a load balancer or a set of load balancers that we've attached a private link service to. And the customer's private link endpoint connects to that service. And so behind that load balancer is traditional load balancing. So you have a set of, you know, targets and any connection that comes into the load balancer will land on one of those targets. And so it's uh, right now it's our Envoy proxy that we're running right there. And then we ah. route with SNI um, straight to uh, Kafka. SNI. SNI, sorry. <laughs> Server name indication. It's, it's That's uh, the, the uh, in the SSL, the, the, the name. Correct. Yeah, it, it's, it tells the, the server what surf certificate to pass to the client. So um, in the end, it's enough so that the server can supply a specific certificate per name, but we can also route based on it. And so the client, uh, just by 
uh, virtue of connecting to some name, DNS name on the internet, we'll put that name into the uh, connection so that um, the server can serve it a certificate so they can validate it as an identity. And then we route to the Kafka broker based on that. Got it. That makes sense. Um, that all seems delicate. And there's a lot of software uh, to write <laughs> to make that work. This is not easy. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, but what uh, w what kinds of things can people build now that would have been difficult without it? Um, I can imagine some examples, but what do you see? What sticks out to you as the cool stuff? I mean, it, uh, it's it's super nice to be able to connect to multiple Confluent cloud clusters. Um, some companies have a number of um, VPCs in the cloud, like hundreds per region. Um, now it's it's quite trivial for those types of companies to private link into Confluent Cloud without having to kind of make sure there's a certain IP range that doesn't conflict with any of those hundred VPCs in the cloud. So now all of a sudden, like the connectivity is very simple um, and it just works. So right. the, the other aspect is just the security posture. So a lot of banks, they don't want, you know, a compromising Confluent to compromise them. And with a peering solution, it could be that if Confluent were compromised, they have, you know, we have an open door into their private network. Right. Um, and no longer do they have to give up that security posture to use our product. Not that we would be compromised. <laughs> we're doing our due diligence there, of course. Certainly. But but uh, it's it's just a matter of risk to them in any case. They yeah. want to make sure they minimize it. So. Yeah, yeah, we're we're some entity that's not them, and so exactly. there's there's a degree to which we are less trusted because that's that's just how their own security audits and analysis have to be. Yep, yeah, exactly that makes sense. Um, yeah, we would simply we would certainly say the same thing about them, right? We trust <laughs> us, but uh, not gonna not gonna trust anybody else for the sake of securing our own service. Yes, exactly. Or yeah. at least we'll audit and be intentional about the, the the kind and level of trust that we extend. Yep. yep. All right. The other interesting aspect of that is now that we're not sharing IP space, um, the more that they kind of grow their usage, um, before with like a peering solution, we could have like used less IP space um, and it would have been more convenient, but it would also mean that if they were ever to grow their usage of Confluent Cloud, they could run out on our end and it would make it very hard to kind of like expand. It would be like a migration. Again, with private link, those things are decoupled now. And so expansion, adding more clusters, removing clusters, all these things can happen without kind of any network considerations. It just works. So. Right. It seems like, just listening to you describe this, it seems like the hard part is the load balancer on our side of the, the link. Um, like it, it seems like that's where all the routing information needs to live and yeah. cluster cluster sizing is going to change metadata and that needs to be reflected there in a big hurry and all that. It just seems like that's where the money is. Am I, so first question, is that true? I don't know if it's where the money is. I mean, it's definitely where we've put a lot of work into making yeah. sure that um, it, it, um, it functions correctly. Right. Yeah. The money in that sense, like people, engineers had to spend time there. It, it should be invisible, right? Yeah. It, it should be the, the boring old infrastructure that just works. It uh -huh, should be, uh -huh. yeah. So. Which is often super hard to make. <laughs> Correct. Especially when you have this ridiculous, elastically scaling thing happening, this amorphous blob of, of Kafka brokers that just look like a cluster and topics yeah. and everything's completely fine, but yeah. it's a very dynamic situation over here and, and, um, you know, software upgrades happening and, and, you know, rolling upgrades all the time. It's this this quantum foam of Kafka on our side, but it's yeah. fine. Yeah. You don't yeah. know a thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you have these amazingly performing topics uh, and and you've got some KSQL DB. Everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, what what was interesting about or what, what, what has been interesting about building that? Is that... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's much different than your standard kind of load balancer solution. I mean... This is not like a HTTP server where huh. connections kind of come and go all the time. So um, that layer has to kind of evolve to be more and more like handle these long-lived connections that Kafka likes, or, or at least treat them such that as updates come in, 
uh, we very slowly kind of drain those connections off of those nodes so that we're not impacting Kafka traffic. So that, that part is delicate and uh, we're introducing technology at that later to make that ever more better than it is today. So yeah, that, that really Kafka load balancing client client load balancer layer is kind of what that is, right? Yeah. 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 Um, the historical architecture is that, um, I guess there really isn't load balancing as such. I mean, it's, there's hashing, there's the client library, things generally work out okay, as long mm -hmm. as there's no key that, that dominates, uh, you know, 90% of the traffic in a topic or, you know, in a high traffic topic or something. So it's, it's just not a thing, but now with this, it really is a thing. And that building that highly specialized Kafka load balancer kind of feels like the, uh, the, the place where a lot of the effort has gone. Yeah, for sure. Um, for you, what's, what's fun about this for a SRE network engineer background kind of person? Uh, what drew you to this? Um, yeah, it's a very interesting problem to solve. Um, there's a number of just network technologies at this layer that, um, you, you probably don't get to really use too often until you've caught problems like this. So, uh, we're looking at like EBPF, um, uh, as some way to help here, but that, really that stands like, for, Oh, uh, I think it, I think it's either extensible Berkeley packet filter or extended Berkeley packet filter. I, I don't actually definitely recall. some sort of extending happening. It, some, some E on the normal BPF, um, <laughs> that, I, unfortunately I don't know at the moment, but, but yeah, we're, we're looking at that technology as well to, to figure out how to sustain these TCP connections and be least interruptive. Um, in this uh, connectivity path. So how can we hand off TCP connections between nodes um, uh, and those kinds of problems? So it's, it's a pretty interesting layer for the, the networking space. Nice. So. Sounds like it. I just, being naughty here during the podcast, I just Googled eBPF. I actually Googled RBBF first, which is the Royal um, Bahamas Police Force. That's definitely not <laughs> what we want. And funny, just looking at the page, it it doesn't, Okay, here's a button that says, what is eBPF? And <laughs> scanning it, it's just, Dan, it's not going to say. No, I know. <laughs> it's just, it, well, okay, all right, fine. You know it's, what? It's, Link in the show notes <laughs> and you, you get the idea. It's yeah. it's BPF, but uh, there's more to it. it. In the end, it's it's like compiled uh, like code that gets inserted into the kernel. That runs like, And so it's like this micro VM inside the kernel, the Linux kernel that... Um, kind of runs this stuff. So it's it's much faster than any kind of user space um, network handling that you could do. Maybe not DPDK or anything, but um, it's 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 an interesting solution as well. Nice. Um, uh, final final question. Are you hiring? We are hiring. We are hiring for everything in the networking space. So folks that are interested in this like load balancer layer as well as um, the control plane layer for creating peerings, managing peerings, private links. Um, uh, it's, it's a very hot space at Confluent. So. There's uh, there's cool problems to solve and podcasts are forever. So if you're listening to this a long time, we're recording this early May, 2021. Uh, if you're listening to this a long time in the future, my guess is we'll still be hiring in that space, <laughs> but uh, there'll be a link in the show notes that'll take you to the career page if you're interested. Um, and that this isn't intended to be a Confluent recruiting commercial, but uh, like you said, this is stuff that um, to the, the foundational technologies, if you if you engineer networks or work with them at all, the basic ideas are the things that you're going to be able to traffic in. But uh, it's kind of cool to deal with them at this scale and to say, well, yeah, I know that's how the service works, but um, you know, here are the actual places the skeletons are buried in this cloud provider. You know, this is the stuff that you get to learn. And that's mm -hmm. cool stuff. So if you're interested, check it out. Sure. My guest today has been Dan Lamont. Dan, thanks for being a part of Streaming Audio. Thank you, Tim. And there you have it. Hey, you know what you get for listening to the end? Some free Confluent Cloud. Use the promo code 60PDCAST, that's 60PDCAST, to get an additional $60 of free Confluent Cloud usage. Be sure to activate it by December 31st, 2021, and use it within 90 days after activation. Any unused promo value after the expiration date is forfeit. And there are a limited number of codes available, so don't miss out. 
Anyway, as always, I hope this podcast was useful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, you can always reach out to me on Twitter at TL Berglund. That's T-L-B-E-R-G. L-U-N-D, or you can leave a comment on a YouTube video or reach out on Community Slack or on the Community Forum. There are sign-up links for those things in the show notes if you'd like to sign up. And while you're at it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover it, especially if it's a five-star review, and we think that's a good thing. So thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.